Hello, Saints. I'm Arnett, and this is Zebulun, where truth lives, sharing the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who created the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. Found in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12, also known as the everlasting gospel, or the three angels' messages. Today's topic, the great controversy, chapter 6. We're going to finish chapter 6 today. Huss and Jerome, the voice of the martyrs. I've given it that subtitles because I feel like these martyrs, we deserve to hear their last words. We deserve to hear what they were thinking that were willing to give their life for Christ. We can learn quite a bit from them. But before we proceed, let's have prayer. Loving Father, we come before you this morning thanking you for the gift of life and pray that we would live it to your honor and your glory. We pray that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Help us to um, become more like Christ as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we find ourselves in, uh, we're under the pale horse right here, but we're in chapter six. This is right before the Protestant Reformation. This is in the 1300s. And uh, so we're in the pale horse, fourth epic time period. And um, John Huss, uh, before I start, <laughs> This, last, this uh, chapter, um, I found myself highlighting s almost every other paragraph, wanting to put it in here, and it, it, it would have been too long. Uh, there was so much I had to, I wanted to add, but um, I didn't want the, uh, obviously, to just read the whole chapter because uh, time wouldn't permit it. I try to keep these at an hour or not too much past an hour or a little less than an hour. But uh, a French author, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, once said something that I wrote down a long time ago, and I, I use it when I'm writing sermons and when I'm making presentation. And he said this, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And that's pretty much how I do my sermons and uh, my presentations. I, I put relevant information in, and then I just look at what can I take away? What can I take away to bring it down to a workable amount? And then when there's just, just nothing left that I can take away, then I know I'm done. Um. Let's consider John Huss. Huss had humble beginnings. Um, John Huss was a, of humble birth and was early left an orphan by the death of his, of his father. His father died, I believe, in his teens, young, his younger teens. His pious mother regarded education and the fear of God as the most valuable of possessions sought to secure this heritage for her son. So that's a lesson for us. Um, she was a very wise woman, obviously, and she regarded education and the fear of God. I would put the fear of God first and then education. Those are two key things. Study, study. Whatever your job is, study the word of God. Study, um, learn how to use your, con your concordance. Learn how to use a uh, Strong's Concordance, and uh, learn how to, to look words up in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic at, for deeper understanding of what the original writers meant. Um, compare scriptures and also uh, get a good education. The more you learn about various subjects, especially history, the better equipped you'll be to uh, handle the Word of God. Huss studied at provin provincial school. I think that's like public school. And then repaired to the university at Prague. He was a very good student. 
He received admission as a charity scholar. Uh, he was accompanied on the journey to Prague by his mother. I can picture that, him and his mother heading to Prague for him to go to college. His mother, uh, widowed and poor, she had no gifts of worldly wealth to bestow upon her son. But as they drew near to the great city, she kneeled down beside the fatherless youth and invoked for him the blessing of their father in heaven. She prayed for her son. Little did that mother realize how her prayer was to be answered. And so that's the humble beginnings of John Huss. Now, while he was in his in school, and as he, I think it was after he graduated, uh, two evangelists came to Prague, and uh, they were preaching about the abuses going on in the church of that time, which was a Roman Catholic church. And um, pretty soon, the authorities stopped them from preaching. And uh, not to be denied, they these men were artists. And so instead of preaching, they drew a big mural. On one side, they had the humble Christ. And on the other side, they had the haughty Pope in all of his regalia. And uh, this is not the exact picture, but I try to recreate it in my own mind with this next slide. Here you have Christ humble, simple, man of the people. This is his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And then here you have the Pope being carried with his golden crown and bishops and the, the fish miter. And <clears throat> this made a deep impression on John Huss. And uh, as he compared the two, and how dissimilar they were, almost even opposite they were. And um, he began to, uh, let's see, he began to study the writings of Wycliffe and um, the Bible. And uh, it, in her letter, okay, as he studied those things, he began to see more clearly the abuses that were going on in the church, his church, the Catholic church. And he was critical of those abuses. Um, and uh, we're going to fast forward to uh, the time when there were three popes vying for supremacy. And uh, the um, Sigusman, the emperor, said this is not good because crime was increasing. People were just selling indulgences everywhere for the forgiveness of sins, for money. And um, even the popes themselves were hiring uh, men to commit murder and to, um, they were fighting against each other with weapons, carnal weapons, you know, with the sword. And um, finally they called a uh, conference to settle this. And also they uh, asked, they summoned Huss to come as well and um, to bring it down to one Pope and to uh, deal with Huss and some of his writings. So um, he was promised safe passage and he finally went, but he knew that they, he probably couldn't trust their word because you know, when you're a man of God, you should be a man of your word. When you say you're going to do something, you should do it. But um, they didn't keep their word on his safe passage. And this is a letter he wrote right before his departure for this conference. In a letter addressed to his friends at Prague, he said, My brethren, I am departing with a safe conduct from the king to meet my numerous and mortal enemies. He considered the papacy and these leaders his mortal enemies because uh, they were seeking to take his life for following his conscience. I confide altogether in the all-powerful God, my, in my Savior. I trust that he will listen to your ardent prayers. They were praying for him to be safely returned to them. 
that he will infuse his prudence and his wisdom into my mouth in order that I may resist them and that he may accord me his Holy Spirit to fortify me in his truth. So when Hus goes there, what is he relying on? He's relying on the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And that he will accord me his Holy Spirit to fortify me in his truth so that I may face with courage, temptations, prison, and if necessary, a cruel death. Jesus Christ suffered for his well-beloved, and therefore ought we to be astonished that he has left us his example in order that we may ourselves endure with patience all things for our own salvation? He is God, and we are his creatures. He is the Lord, and we are his servants. He is master of the world, and we are contemptible mortals. Yet he... Whoops. Wrong way. Yet he suffered. Why then should we not suffer? Also, particularly when suffering is for us purification. You know what the Bible says is that all that live godly will face persecution. And many people face no persecution because they're not living up to God's word and being faithful to what it says. They want to be man pleasers and uh, speak soft words to try to appease people that are going contrary to the word of God. Therefore, beloved, if my death ought to contribute to his glory, pray that it may come quickly and that he may enable me to support all my calamities with constancy. He's praying for strength if he is put to death, that he can face it with courage and that it will come quickly. But if it be better that I return amongst you, let us pray to God that I may return without stain. That is, that I may suppress one, that I may not suppress one tittle of the truth of the gospel. Zebulon, where truth lives. That's what we're about here, to share the truth of the gospel in order to leave my brethren an excellent example to follow. I want to follow that example. What about you? Probably, therefore, you will never more behold my face at Prague. That should be Prague, my bad. But should the will of the all-powerful God deign to restore me to you, let us then advance with a former heart in the knowledge and love of his um, of his I'm not sure what that last word is <laughs> anyway I need to be more careful in my typing so here here Huss is at the consul of Constance in Germany Constance Germany he's under pressure from the Holy Roman Emperor us uh, well under pressure from the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund, John the Twenty Third, the successor of uh, the Pisa Pope, summoned a consul at Constance, principally to reunite Christendom, but also to examine the teachings of John Wycliffe, who is dead by now, and John Huss, and to reform the church. So, the the church was having a lot of abuses going on, murders, uh, adultery, um, selling of indulgences, uh, abuses of all kinds. And even this emperor seeing that there needed to be reform in the church, there needed to be only one pope, according to him. Actually, you don't need any pope. And they wanted to examine the writings of Wycliffe and of Huss. That was the purpose of this uh, consul. Now, um, when Huss got there, they went back on their word and they arrested him and put him in a, a dungeon. Enfeebled by illness and imprisonment, Huss was at last brought before the consul. Loaded with chains, he stood in the presence of the emperor 
whose honor and good faith had been pledged to protect him. During his long trial, he firmly maintained the truth, and in the presence of the assembled dignitaries of church and state, he uttered a solemn and faithful protest against the corruptions of the hierarchy. When required to choose whether he would recant his doctrines or suffer death, he accepted the martyr's faith. Fate. He said, I'm not going to go back on the truth even to save my life, even on pain of death. That's faithful. Here's a letter he wrote. I write this letter in my prison and with my fettered hand, expecting my sentence of death tomorrow. These are precious words. When with the assistance of Jesus Christ, we shall gain again meet in the delicious peace of the future life, you will learn how merciful God has shown himself toward me, how effectually he has supported me in the midst of my temptations and trials. He's saying when we get to heaven, he's going to tell us how faithfully God took care of him during these hours. With what face, then, should I behold the heavens? In other words, what kind of continence should I have? What face should I face the heavens with? Should I be a coward or should I be um, bold for Christ? How should I look to those multitudes of men to whom I have preached the pure gospel? No, I esteem their salvation more than this poor body. In other words, he's saying what the people I preach to think is more important than this body. Now appointed unto death, <clears throat> excuse me. Finally, they put on his head a cap or pyramidal shaped miter of paper on which were painted frightful figures of demons. So they put this pointed hat on his head, drew demons on it. And the word, <clears throat> the word arch heretic, that means chief heretic, conspicuous in front. And Huss said, most joyfully, said Huss, will I wear this crown of shame for thy sake, O Jesus, who for me didst wear a crown of thorns. And I do commit my spirit into thy hands, O Lord Jesus, for thou hast redeemed me. Wow. And then here's another, uh, some more words of, of Huss. And when they were interrogating him, he said, what errors shall I renounce? I know myself guilty of none. I call God to witness that all that I have written and preached has been with the view of rescuing souls from sin and perdition. And therefore, most joyfully, will I confirm with my blood the truth which I have written and preached. He loved the truth even unto death. We have to be like that. We have to preach the truth, come what may. And um, even on pain of death. When the flames kindled about him, he began to sing, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That's, a, that's an old song. And so continued till his voice was silence forever. And I believe that God was protecting him from the pain of those flames until his voice was finally silenced in death. One must ask, is that the behavior of Christ's church on earth to burn a man to death? for criticizing abuses he sees in the church and for following his conscience and the Bible? The answer to me is obvious. What say you? Now, Hush had a partner, Jerome, and uh, Jerome was uh, with Hus in his work, and he had made a vow to Hus to protect him and, and to support him. And when Huss was at the council, uh, Jerome headed to Prague to support his friend. But by the time he got there, he saw it was useless. He was already arrested 
and condemned to death. And he, Jerome tried to leave the city, but he was arrested also. And when Jerome was cast into prison, into the dungeon, when they brought him out, um, his faith weakened. Here, let me read what it says. But now, weakened by illness, he was in he was in a dungeon for like a year. He was weakened by illness and by the rigors of his prison house and the torture of anxiety and suspense. Separated from his friends and disheartened by the death of Huss, Jerome's fortitude gave way and he consented to submit to the consul. He pledged himself to adhere to the Catholic faith and accepted the action of the consul in condemning the doctrines of Wycliffe, Cliff, and Huss, accepting, however, the holy truths which they had taught. So, so is that how the is that how Jesus got people to accept the truth? By torturing them, by throwing them in, in dungeons until they accepted Christ? Or did he leave it up to our free conscience? to either accept him or reject him. These truths that I'm sharing with you, it's up to you to accept it or reject it. If you reject it, I'll, I'll pray for you, but um, I'm not gonna torture you. I'm not gonna burn you. You have a free conscience to follow truth as you see it. So Jerome regains his footing and uh, when they put him back in the dungeon, he was like, oh, what did I do? At least when he was suffering, he had a clear conscience, but now he has a guilty conscience. Because he knows that Wycliffe and Huss were telling the truth. And now he's rejected their teachings. And uh, Jerome regains his footing. And uh, when they bring him out, expecting him to recant further, Recant just means to say you're sorry for what you're teaching. He he made a, a 180 degree turn and and um, took back his recantation. These are his words. Um, well, they're on the next slide. Let's go there now. But in the solitude of his dungeon, he saw more clearly what he had done. He thought of the courage and fidelity of Huss, and in contrast pondered upon his own denial of the truth. He thought of the divine master whom he had pledged himself to serve, and who for his sake endured the death of the cross. Before his retraction, he had found comfort amid all his sufferings in the assurance of God's favor. Even though you're suffering, you can find comfort that you're being faithful to the truth. But now remorse and doubts tortured his soul. He knew that still other retractions must be made before he could be at peace with Rome. They weren't going to stop there. They were going to draw more um, retractions from him. The path upon which he was entering could end only in complete apostasy. When you leave the road of truth, you're headed toward apostasy. You must be faithful to Christ. You must be faithful to the truth. His resolution was taken. To escape a brief period of suffering, he would not deny his Lord. So he's willing to suffer for a brief period rather than deny his Lord. Now I'm going to go back here. His execution exhibited to the whole world the perfidious cruelty of Rome, the enemies of truth, though they knew it not, had been furthering the cause which they vainly sought to destroy. We're going to come back to that statement. Let's continue. Having renounced his former recantation, he said, you have held me shut up 340 days in a frightful prison in the midst of filthy noise, noisomeness stench, and the utmost want of everything. You then bring me out before you, and lending an ear to my mortal enemies, you refuse to hear me. 
if you be really wise men and the lights of the world, take care not to sin against justice. As to me, I am only a feeble mortal. My life is but of little importance. And when I exhort you not to deliver an unjust sentence, I speak less for myself than for you. So he's saying, really, I'm not begging for my life. Um, I, 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 I'm counseling you not to uh, execute me, but not for my sake, for your sake, because my blood will be on your hands. So he's, he's selfless, and he's pleading really for them. His request was finally granted. In the presence of his judges, Jerome kneeled down and prayed that the divine spirit might control his thoughts and words that he might speak nothing contrary to the truth or unworthy of his master. To him that day was fulfilled the promise of God to the first disciples. Ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. Remember when Jesus told the disciples that? But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, which speaketh in you. The words of, uh, and I should have wrote down a scripture for that. That's a quote from Jesus. The words of Jerome excited astonishment and admiration, even in his enemies. For a whole year, he had been immured in a dungeon, unable to read or even to see, in great physical suffering and mental anxiety. Yet his arguments were presented with as much clearness and power as if he had had undisturbed opportunity for study. Why? Because the Holy Spirit and this promise from Scripture. Speaking of Huss, he said, I knew him from his childhood. Now he's testifying about Huss. He was a most excellent man, just and holy. He was condemned notwithstanding his innocence. I also am ready to die. I will not recoil before the torments that are prepared for me by my enemies and false witnesses. That's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bear false witness. These people were lying on him just to kill him so that he wouldn't criticize the church. How low can you get? Who will one day have to render an account of their imposters before the great God whom nothing can dis can deceive. Um, these men who killed uh, Jerome and Huss are going to have to answer to God one day. In response to their cries of heretic, Jerome continued, What? Do you suppose that I fear to die? You have held me for a whole year in a frightful dungeon more horrible than death itself. You have treated me more cruelly than a Turk, Jew, or a pagan and my flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive. And yet I make no complaint, for lamentation ill becomes a man of heart and spirit. Remember that? That's the oil and the wine, the blood and the, the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ. The oil and the wine. Remember we hurt not the oil and the wine? That was from the Diatara Church. But I cannot but express my astonishment at such great barbarity toward a Christian. He couldn't believe their, how they were acting. Prove to me from the holy writings that I am in error, and I will adjure. Chula, go outside. His last words uttered as the flames rose about him were a prayer. This is his last words as he was dying. Lord Almighty, Father, have pity on me, and pardon me my sins, for thou knowest that I have always loved thy truth. His voice ceased, but his lips continued to move in prayer. When the fire had done its work, the ashes of the martyr, with the earth upon which they rested, were gathered up, and like those of Hus, were thrown into the Rhine. They also went and dug up the bones of Wycliffe and burned them and cast them into the Rhine River. They thought that this is how you can get rid of somebody and uh, God will not be able to resurrect them. But but uh, God can resurrect you if you burn to death 
uh, God has your DNA in his book and it's, and he can recreate you with a new spiritual body. Um, Go back here. His execution had exhibited to the whole world the perfidious cruelty of Rome. So everybody saw what happened to Huss and Jerome, and they knew that it was wrong. The enemies of truth, look at the enemies of truth, though they knew it not, had been furthering the cause which they vainly sought to destroy. Um, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 8 is a good scripture. We can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Huss and Jerome, they could do nothing against the truth, only for the truth. When you speak the truth, if they burn you, it's still for the truth. There's nothing they can do. When you're sharing the truth, nothing can stop, stop you. They can, tr they can try to silence you in death, but it, it brought even more people into the church. And they're going to be resurrected. So there's there's nothing that can stand up against the truth, only for the truth. Now, next time on Zebulon, we're going to move to chapter 7 and the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Chapter 7 is entitled Luther's Separation from Rome and the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So we'll study that next time. Um, may the life and death of Huss and Jerome be an encouragement to you to speak the truth and to be courageous and to don't let people intimidate you and, and make you fearful to share truth uh, in these last days um, when so many people are buckling under and um, uh, compromising the truth uh, just to be accepted by the world. Um, but we need to stand for Christ and, uh, and his truth word um, come what may let us pray loving father we thank you for the example of Huss and jerome who were fortified and empowered by your holy spirit we pray that that same spirit would empower us to share truth in our lives with people that we know and come in contact with help us to know truth and help us to share it with courage and we thank you lord that uh, that you were you have promised in your word that you will not put more on us than, than that which we were able to bear. And uh, that in every temptation, you will provide a way of escape, Lord. I, I believe that you, that you um, um, like the three Hebrew words of these who were cast into a fiery furnace, they didn't even feel the flames. When they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. And I believe you'll do the same for us, Lord. You will not uh, put more on us than we can bear. And if any of us have to face a martyr's death, give us the courage to be tr faithful to your word until the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, see you next time, uh, saints. May God be with you till we meet again.